So here's a phylogenetic tree that we've looked at. We've seen this, I don't know how many times in this class. Bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Those three organisms come together into a common last, a last common ancestor. We identified the location of this in the tree using pairs of duplicated genes like EFTU and EFGE, et cetera. What do we know about that last common ancestor? So if something is true in bacteria and also true in eukarya and archaea, then certainly it was true in this last common ancestor. It inherited those traits from, from this last common ancestor. So what do we know? What's common to all of these different kinds of living things? Almost everything, right? Basic metabolism, cellular envelopes, DNA, RNA, particular metabolic pathways and the enzymes that carry out those pathways. There's an enormous amount of biochemistry and structure, processes, and central dogma. You know, DNA replication, repair, transcription, translation, post-translational modification. All that stuff is common to all living things, and therefore, the last common ancestor could do those things, almost certainly. And so this means that the last common ancestor was pretty far down the evolutionary chain in terms of where it started out. It was a lot like modern organisms like Thermococcus cellar. Certainly, it's not, it wasn't primitive in the sense of not very far evolved. It was, a, it was quite a sophisticated creature or population, most likely, of course. <clears throat> so what happened before that? Well, probably there was a time early in evolution where organisms were uh, what you would call progenodes. And, and, and there's some argument about whether the last common ancestor may have been the last of the progenodes, and that the emergence of these evolutionary lineages may represent the emergence of organisms from the progenotic state. In other words, a progenote is an organism in which the linkage between the genome and the phenotype was not very good. Where, where transcription and translation were not efficient and not accurate. And so the organism's ability to store information and to express that information in terms of phenotype wasn't that good. Because the ribosome was a pretty complicated machine, right? There had to have been a simpler state before that. What it was like is unclear. Before that, Many folks will argue there had to have been a thing called the RNA world. Um, it, it's difficult to, to believe that RNA, DNA, and protein were all invented at the same time. And so if they weren't invented at the same time, which came first? Well, protein can't store information, right? DNA can't do anything. It's just a repository. RNA can do both. There are any number of RNA viruses that where their genomes are, are RNA. RNA genomes are, are, are common. And, and storing information in RNA is no different conceptually than storing information in DNA. There are, however, also some RNAs that do things. The whole protein, trans, the, the whole protein synthesis machinery is fundamentally an RNA-based machine mRNA, tRNAs, ribosomal RNAs, that's the RNAs that do the work. This whole process is an RNA-based machinery. There are other catalytic RNAs involved in viral replication that we've talked about, RNASP that the folks in my lab have worked with over the years. Um, and you can make RNAs that do a wide variety of things. Single-stranded RNAs can fold up into globular, more or less globular structures and, and act in many ways like protein enzymes. And so the notion is, is that there was this RNA world before the invention of protein and DNA. There are some huge caveats to this. Have any of you guys worked with RNA in a lab before? Anybody else? RNA has a reputation of being delicate. Look at it wrong, and it starts to hydrolyze. Um, this is largely an artifact of the, folk, of the fact that people in molecular biology throw RNAs around like candy. Um, the other thing is that it's pretty sensitive to pH and it's pretty sensitive to metal ions. Uh, lead, it binds lead and lead will hydrolyze the RNA backbone quickly. Um, 
So RNA is, is, is not very robust as a, start, a potential starting molecule for life. It's worse than this, though. Um, RNA, it has a ribose phosphate backbone, right? Do you have any idea how many isomers of pentose there are? Over 100. And so how do you make D ribose without making all these other isomers as well? There's, there's been no non-biological mechanism proposed for the synthesis of ribose that doesn't also generate all these other weird sugars that would presumably be, in, be inhibitors of any RNA synthesis process. And so whether the RNA world existed or not is a little unclear. It's also possible that maybe the original backbone of a pre-RNA, of a pre-nucleic uh, acid, might not have been a sugar or might not have been at least a pentose like it is in DNA and RNA. You can make perfectly good structures using glycerol. That's a backbone, glycerol phosphate instead of uh, ribose phosphate. You can even use a peptide backbone to make nucleic acids. That's pretty cool. But none of those things exist in modern biology, and so probably didn't exist before that. This whole RNA world business is, is pretty interesting. We'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, but, but this creates an issue. This last common ancestor, I showed you on the, on the thing here, that there's clear evidence for life, more or less as we know it, only 200 million years after the last sterilizing bombardments. This implies that the origin of life and, and progress through all of these complicated steps ending up in an organism with hugely complicated biochemistry and structure occurred in only 200 million years. There are two possible, I think, solutions to this conundrum. One of them is the obvious that simple systems, as they emerge, evolve very rapidly compared to more um, um, de well-developed systems. Think about computers. Computers, I mean, when I was uh, you know, your age, computers went through, an ev every year you had to buy a new computer because things had completely changed. Now you don't have to do that, right? Yeah, they improve a little bit year after year, but they don't change that much. Emer the more complicated a system is, the more interactions there are within the system, the slower it can evolve. And so early life may have been able to evolve very quickly. And you see this in biological systems. When a new kind of organism emerges, it usually changes very rapidly. This could be the Cambrian explosion, for example at the invention of, of what you might consider truly multicellular animals. The other solution to this problem is, is a little more, I think, problematic. Uh, there are people who argue that this couldn't, that evolution couldn't possibly have gone this rapid to start with. Um, and so the origin of life must have been much sooner than that. Well, if it was much sooner than that, it wasn't on planet Earth. And so the notion is, is that Earth may have been seeded by life that originated somewhere else, either further out the gravitational well of, of our universe or, or further than that. Um, I don't think that much about that because I would like to see some evidence of which there is none. 